right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, right on time for us to begin. Um, I uh, was talking with Lawrence a while back about just some of the, the memories. Some of you are familiar with or maybe knew Dee Bowman. And uh, Lawrence uh, trained under Dee, and I grew up where Dee preached. And uh, he was just sharing some of his experiences during the two years that he was there at Southside. And he said one of the things that they talked about was how uh, after a, a sermon, you knew it was like a really, really good sermon when afterwards you were like, I, I want to get up and preach. Not because you thought you could do a better job, but because it was just like, <coughs> all right, I'm, I'm on fire. I want to get. And uh, uh, I was thinking about this morning after the, uh, the Lord's Supper talk. It's almost like there's another layer of that where it's like, I just want to worship. I just want to sing. I just want to keep singing and praising after that Lord's Supper talk, um, as we reflect on what Jesus has done, uh, what God has done through Christ for us and in us and through us. Um, and uh, seeing that I'm teaching this morning, maybe some of you are like, yeah, amen, amen. Um, <laughs> let's just keep singing. <laughs> but, but I do think that, that what we'll talk about today, uh, there could not have been a better Lord's Supper talk to lead up to this class. Um, and so if it starts to take, I'll just, we'll just pull out song books. Um, but but the, the irony that we're talking about, the, this is the chief of all ironies. Um, and it is the irony of the cross. The irony of the cross. One thing that I think is kind of interesting for us to consider is how there are these different symbols of Christianity. So you have kind of on the, like, a decal on the back of a car, you might see like the fish sticker. I feel like it's not as common now, but you might see the fish sticker being fishers of men. Uh, of course, on Resurrection Sunday, you might have an empty tomb as the most recognized symbol. But it's interesting of all the symbols that we might be able to think of, of Christianity, the symbol is the cross. And so I want to start just with this sort of discussion, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll pray first, and then we'll get into this discussion. But I want us to just think about that. Why, why is the cross, why has the cross become the symbol of Christianity? So let's start with a prayer, and then we'll open up that question. Oh, Lord our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We come into your presence in awe and wonder at who you are and the ways that you've blessed us and provided for us, the ways that you've brought us here. We're thankful this morning that you have assembled us, that you've brought in families together, and that most importantly, you've brought this family together. You've brought your people together who are redeemed by the blood of your son on the cross. Lord, as we look into that cross this morning, please open our eyes, open the eyes of our heart, to not only see, but to grasp uh, and comprehend the cross in such a way that it changes us. And we ask your blessing on this hour, and in your son's name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so I just want to start with that question. Of all the symbols that we might think of, why do you think, and, and maybe there's not a specific verse that says, the cross shall be the dominant symbol of Christianity, but why do you think it is through the ages the cross has been the symbol of Christianity? Y'all have any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we often talk about how everything in the Bible points to the cross. Like, it's either, like, looking forward to Christ and his sacrifice or looking back at it. So, like, that is, like, a big, like, climax of the Bible, right? And then along with that, I think, um, again, a big thing in Christianity, Christianity that sets it apart is the sacrifice of Christ as yeah. compared to like other world religions. So I think like it's a big part of the Bible. It's a big thing that sets Christianity apart. Um, yeah. 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 Really good. Thought. And that's one thing I've loved about the Lord's Supper talks, how we've come to see more and more how it all does point to Christ. It all does foreshadow the cross. And um, you mentioned something else in there, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on. That was a really, really good thought. Yes, ma'am. No one experienced the cross 
and had any experience other than death. But Christ did. So it was the Christ cross became life or death's life. Absolutely. Yeah, and in that story, looking back to the children of Israel with what was going on in uh, with the, the serpents and Moses raising up the bronze serpent, it's this it's this reversal of the curse. There's something that's so compelling about that. There's there's this reversal of the curse that happens. Um, any other thoughts on that? Why? Well, I just think he's the one thing that changed the whole world. And it's a very simple, it's a very simple thing to mm -hmm. make. It's not like having to draw an electric chair. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you raise a good point, and maybe this will allow this to kind of segue. I like how simply you put it that, well, it just change the world you know um so maybe maybe that's why um and, and you used the example of like the electric chair i think that's kind of helpful for us to pause and think about for a second i mean uh, lawrence set this up so well this morning but I, I mean this is the symbol of execution um and nowadays we walk around and we you know wear it as a necklace or jewelry or we have it you know all over um, and I think that's a good thing. I don't, I don't think that's a, a bad thing at all. But isn't that amazing that uh, what was 2,000 years ago, the most horrific symbol of execution becomes now everywhere we look. Uh, we, we're, we're, uh, m maybe we've begun to devalue or uh, depreciate our uh, understanding of the cross. Um, but it is interesting that it's, it's completely reversed. Um, one historian that I think Lawrence and I have both mentioned before, but one, one historian, he is probably like the foremost scholar on Roman history um, and especially on the sort of uh, history of Christianity's influence in the world. He's not a Christian. Uh, but he's sort of the foremost scholar on how uh, the way that he would put it is if, if, if the West is a fishbowl, Christianity is the water that we're swimming in. We're, we are engulfed by Christianity in ways that we don't even realize. But it's interesting, uh, someone toward the end of the lecture that he gave asked that question. Um, why do you think that the cross became the symbol of Christianity as opposed to, say, the empty tomb? And, and this was his response. So again, this is like the foremost scholar. And here's his response to that question. Um, there, not that one. This. <laughs> um, because it's the weirdest thing. Um, I don't want to use that to kind of tri trivialize. I mean, here we just spent 30 minutes reflecting on the meaning of the cross. And so to call it weird, I, I, please understand, I don't mean that to trivialize, tri trivialize it in any way. Um, but what he's getting at is this irony. It is this shocking thing that is incomprehensible when we really dig into it and reflect on it. It, it is the strangest thing. And, and Tom Holland's explanation of that was that that's, what, that's the reason why it became passed down uh, throughout these decades after the cross. Because how, how could it be? That the Jews would claim a, a cruci someone who died the death of a slave, that that could be their Messiah. That is the strangest thing, this irony of the cross. And Paul would actually say something very similar in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, we preach Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who was prophesied about from the very beginning the one who would crush the head of the serpent the son of David who would reign on the throne forever we preach that Messiah crucified he says a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks but to those who are called to those who have their eyes opened to, to see the deeper irony here both Jews and Greeks, all people, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so today, the, 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 the cross has very much taken on that symbol of power and wisdom, particularly in the West. Um, 
But here's how Tom Holland goes on to sort of describe how shocking this would have been to the Greco-Roman world. So we'll work through this, and then we'll come back to Paul's words, and then we'll, we'll look at how the apostles reflect on the cross. But I want to start just by laying a foundation of how shocking the initial irony of the cross would have been. Um, and so Tom Holland, he says this. He says, no death was more excruciating, more contemptible than crucifixion. To be hung naked, long in agony, swelling with ugly wheels and shoulders and chest, on wheels and sh uh, shoulders and chest, helpless to beat away the clamorous birds, such a fate, Roman intellectuals agreed, was the worst imaginable. Nothing spoke more eloquently of a failed revolt than the sight of hundreds upon hundreds of corpse-hung crosses. So foul was the carrion reek of their disgrace that many felt tainted even by viewing a crucifixion. And so this sort of sets up what, uh, what, what would be sort of the foolishness to the Greeks. Uh, this is the, the shocking nature of the cross. And it's interesting for the Greeks, for the Gentile world, it, it wasn't so shocking that a human could become God. By this point, by the time that Jesus was crucified, uh, the number one, the, the fastest growing cult in the Roman world was not at that time Christianity in the time of the apostles. It was uh, Divi Filius, son of the gods, where uh, it was this imperial cult that worshipped the emperor as the son of the god, the risen savior of, of Rome. And so it was not shocking to them that uh, a, a, a man could ascend to the realm of the gods and be honored and worshipped as God, but that this man could become God. That a crucified Jewish slave could claim the same titles as the son of the God, uh, as the, 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 the proclamation of the Roman world of the emperor. Um, and so he, he goes on to say this, that divinity then was... For the very greatest of the great, for victors and heroes and kings, its measure was the power to torture one's enemies, not to suffer it oneself, to crucify them after conquering the world. That a man who had himself been crucified might be hailed as a god could not help but be seen by people everywhere across the Roman world as, he says, scandalous, obscene, and grotesque. So here's this initial layer of irony to the Greco-Roman world. This jarring, unbelievable, how can this be kind of uh, uh, irony. But he, he, he continues on to say that the most shocking part of this would have been to Jesus' own people. So here's the last quote that we'll read. But he says, the ultimate offensiveness, though, was to one particular people, Jesus' own. The Jews, unlike their rulers, the, 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 the Greeks and Romans, they did not believe that a man might become a god. They believed that there was only one almighty, eternal deity, creator of the heavens and earth. He was worshipped by them as the most high god, the lord of hosts, the master of all the earth. Empires were his to order, mountains to melt like wax. That such a god of all gods might have had a son, and that this son suffering the fate of a slave might have been tortured to death on a cross were claims as stupefying as they were to most Jews repelling. No more shocking a reversal of their utmost devoutly held assumptions could possibly have been imagined. Not merely blasphemy, it was madness. So here's... The irony of the cross, the initial shocking reversal. If irony is about the reversal or the subversion of expectations, there is no more shocking reversal of expectations in the history of the world than the cross. And so returning back to, to what Paul said there in 1 Corinthians 1, the irony of, of the cross is this to, to the Jews, it's this, it's this stumbling block. They're going along, they have this expectation, they're headed in a direction of what they believe the Messiah will be like. 
and all of a sudden they stumble over this, and it makes no sense. It's the most shocking reversal. And then to the Greeks, it's, it's foolishness. It's senseless. How could it be that a crucified Jewish man would be claimed as the, the son of the God? But it's almost like beyond that initial layer of irony is something so deep and so compelling that it's undeniable. To those who are called, to those who have the eyes to see it, it is the power and the wisdom of God. And so it's as if once we peel back the first layer of shocking reversal, we then see the cosmic irony of the cross, the deeper irony, the theological irony of what is, is truly happening in the irony of of the cross. And so the question that we want to move to is maybe maybe one way we could reflect on the irony of the cross is by looking at how the apostles, how the writers of the New Testament reflected back on this moment. Because I think to them it was just as shocking a reversal. Um, the New Testament writers, the Christians in the first century world, had to wade through that initial layer of irony. The initial layer of shock, this subversion of expectations that would have been so hard for them to grasp. But how do the New Testament authors reflect on the irony of the cross? Because while many see it as a stumbling block and as foolishness, they see past it to something that is so much deeper and profound and glorious. And so the first is there in Ephesians chapter 2. And as we go through these, I want us to just sort of quickly take in the way that the New Testament writers are pointing to this irony. So as they write these letters, they're looking back on this moment, and they're writing to these churches what's truly going on in this moment. And so with each of these, I just want to uh, ask after each one, what, what is the irony that the New Testament writers are pointing to. So let's start just with this first one. It says, For he himself, speaking of Christ, is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, making peace, and that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So in this letter of Paul to the Ephesians, what, what is the irony, what's the irony that Paul is, is pointing to here? If I can take a second to go back, and I guess I'm just stating the obvious, is that they keep saying that man became God. And the irony is that God became man. Yeah. That's, that's one of the biggest ironies uh, w within Scripture. Um, and and that's, what, that's what I was thinking of. When you mentioned that comment, Abigail, that, that uh, it's different than every other God because God did become man. There's an incredible poem called The God of the Scars. That's what separates the God of the Bible from every other claimed deity in the world. That we have a God of the scars. That's, that's no other claim that, that any other religion can make. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's the, that's, that's the shocking reversal. That's the, the, the irony of the cross. That it's not just that man uh, became God. And it's, it's more than that. It's that God became man. Um, but within this... Uh, passage in Ephesians 2, what, what's, what do you think is the irony that Paul's getting at? To me, it's, it's the fact that you've read the, the verse already where it talks about the cross being foolishness to one group of people and it being a stumbling block to the other, and yet it is through that very instrument that he brings those two groups of people together you know, to, as one. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it's the, it's I, I, ironically the thing that uh, 
causes people to uh, separate because of different worldviews becomes the very thing that draws all people together. Like in Psalm 22 that we read this morning, all generations, all families, all nations looking to the cross. Um, do y'all see anything else within Ephesians 2? Mentioning peace, the, the most horrific thing is bringing peace. Yeah. And killing hostility by the most hostile thing yeah. ever. So right. that, that it, irony is just rich. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that amazing? I, I just, when we were working through Ephesians a, a few, I guess a, a, a few weeks back, um, this verse just stood out to me so much that by the most hostile death imagined, Jesus put to death hostility. Um, and so let's let's move on to another. Here is uh, Peter's reflection on the cross. Um, in, in through these, what we're going to do, we're going to work through about three or four of these, and then turn to Mark 15, um, and kind of do this ourselves. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting practice to see the apostles. They look back on the cross and they see these ironies, and, and they're drawn into it and they're compelled by it. And so I want us to kind of observe what the apostles are doing here and the way that they look back on the cross. And then we'll, we'll move to Mark 15 and, and, and do the same. But he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So this one, um, I think, really uh, stands out to us. But that last phrase, right, by his wounds... By the Son of God who took on flesh and, and bore the utmost suffering in his body, by his wounding, we are healed. Um, and there's something even more here, I think, in, in that phrase, on the tree. Uh, I should have written the verse down. Maybe someone can remind me. But um, in the law, it's described as cursed is he who hangs on a tree. Um, Here's another reversal of the curse. Peter is using this uh, in reference to, to that, uh, what's written in the law, that curse is he who hangs on a tree. Well, he himself bore our sins. He took on the curse. Uh, he became the cursed one who hangs on a tree and therein reversed the curse. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wound we're healed. Then Paul again in, in Colossians 2. This one is a really fascinating one. Um, and you, who were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside by nailing it to the cross. In this he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So last, again, there's several things, I think, going on in, in this one. Um, but what, what's the striking irony within uh, these few verses here in Colossians? The quote you had earlier talked about the shame of the cross. But that shame turns into rulers and authorities being yeah. publicly triumphed over and shamed. Absolutely. What what they what what the powers and principalities, both of the Jews and the Rome in, in the Roman uh, governor Pilate, what what they mean uh, to shame Christ, and what the powers and principalities, as in those in the heavenly realm, what they mean to shame the Son of God, becomes the very thing by which He triumphs over them. Um, and, and it's also interesting that here, here he is uh, nailed to a cross, and yet he is the one who's disarming the rulers and authorities. Um, and I think there was uh, another one in there, but we'll, we'll keep moving on. Um, this is uh, in Philippians 2. This is like my favorite passage um, uh, I think I've probably mentioned it a lot in, in sermons, um, but th this, is, this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. But speaking of Christ, uh, Paul says, Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, 
by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, he says, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here Paul says that the very, the, the very thing by which Christ humbled himself, he says not, not just by becoming a man, not just by taking on the form of a servant, not just by dying, but dying the death on a cross. Um, that is the very thing through which God exalts him and glorifies him and bestows on him the name that is above every name. And in this, I, I don't want to... Uh, downplay the, the resurrection at all, but, but sometimes we strictly think of the cross as like this horrible moment. And, it, and in one sense it is. I mean, this is part of the irony. Um, but Paul reflects back on it, and these other writers reflect back on it, and they, they say, hey, this is the moment of triumph. This is the moment of exaltation. The resurrection is proof of that. The, the resurrection is, is proof that the Messiah has taken his throne. Um, but in his death on the cross, he is highly exalted, and he's given the name above every name. Um, and in Jesus, he, he says this himself, right? Throughout, uh, particularly the Gospel of John, we see this moment about the hour coming. The hour has not yet come, and it's this hour he talks about as his glorification, uh, the hour that the Son of Man would be glorified. And what is, what is he talking about there? He's, he's talking about his crucifixion. Throughout uh, the Gospel of John, it's like there's this, there, there's this, um, there's this clock that's ticking down. The hour is coming for the Son of Man to be glorified, and it's it's moving toward his death on the cross. His cross is his glorification, and so those are just kind of a a, a, a survey of. Some passages of the way that the apostles reflect back on the irony of the cross. But I like the way that one uh, writer puts it. He, he wrote a book on this, um, The Irony of the Cross. It's a, a really good read if you're interested in diving more into this. But he says, when you consider the awesomeness of God's glory in the depths of Christ's humiliation, it is a jaw-dropping reality that Jesus condescended in this way. He says it's important for us to recognize this because if we miss out on the irony of the cross, we will miss out on the glory of the cross. So to the Jews and Greeks, it was a stumbling block. It was foolishness that repelled them. Uh, it was the kind of irony that was so shocking that it's just unbelievable and they dismiss it. But when the apostles wade past that initial layer of irony, they see its glory. And to stare into the irony of the cross is to have the glory of the cross wash over us. And so let's uh, turn to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. And as we look at, um, we'll, we'll pick up in verse 16. And as we look at this, um, we'll, we'll simply ask the question, what is it that stands out to you here about the irony of the cross? Um, there's so much to be said. There's so much packed in here. There's so, so much that uh, we could continue to look through the words of the apostles. But I want us to, to, to look into this ourselves and uh, just consider, as we read along, what are the ironies of the cross that stand out to you? So beginning in, in verse 16, it says, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and they put his own clothes on him, 
and they led him out to be crucified. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read this, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And then skipping down to <coughs> verse uh, 39, And when the centurion who stood facing him saw <coughs> that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. So there's a lot in here in, in and I imagine in, in the next few minutes we'll only be scratching the surface. But within these verses from Mark 15, 16 through 39, what are the ironies of the cross that stand out to you? In this and in some of the verses that you read earlier, um, the, I think about the feelings of his disciples, specifically his apostles who had given up everything to follow him, and then here they are hiding after he was crucified because they think it's over. Yeah. And the rulers are so excited because they've finally gotten rid of Jesus. But then the turn of events where the rulers are distraught because he comes back to life miraculously, and then the apostles are now so relieved because what they have been, what they had given up everything for is actually true. Yeah. And they didn't get it before it actually happened, you know, but just the fact, like this, the role reversal, reversal and the feelings reversal mm -hmm. of the leaders versus the apostles yeah. on that day of crucifixion and then on the day of resurrection. Yeah, that's a really good point. The reversal between the disciples and between the rulers. And perhaps we could even say sort of on a, on a cosmic level, the triumph of uh, presumably the, 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 the triumph of Satan in that moment, the perceived triumph of Satan in that moment. Um, and uh, perhaps even the, the angels, the, we, we don't know exactly what was going on in that moment, but the shock and despair of the, the throne room of God, um, maybe even as puzzled as the disciples were about what was happening in that moment. And then the reversal comes. Um, any other thoughts on that within these? Yes, sir. Then the actual crucifixion itself is only given four words, and they crucified him. Mm -hmm. It's the same way in all the other Gospels. Uh, I would have thought that, that such, a, such an event in my mind, if I was God, I would want to impress upon these people's cruelty in here by giving some more detail. But in God's wisdom, he just said, and they crucified him. I thought that was very good. Yeah. yeah, that is. That's that's very interesting. Another argument is that they think that this is all they are doing, that it's their cleverness and power that puts them to death, and that <coughs> John records it just when he cried out, like when he saying, it is finished. Later, they 
Okay, that's that's a really good point. Here here are the rulers um, of uh, the, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Here they are gathered together and they're plotting against Christ and jumping through legal loopholes to, to get him on that cross. I mean, they're bending every rule to make this happen. And you can imagine almost, I don't know if they high five back then, but uh, you can almost imagine them high-fiving each other like, oh, we, we got him. I mean, wasn't, this is going to go down as the greatest plot uh, that, that, we've, that we've accomplished. And, and yet, it's the very plan that God has been working from the foundation of the world. And, and they're just pawns within that. Um, very good. The line, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see him and believe. It's the exact opposite. That a few days later when he's vindicated through his resurrection... We then believe that because he stayed on the cross and went to death on our behalf, he is the anointed one, the king of Israel who draws the entire world yeah. to himself. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, we're I, we're going to definitely come back to revisit that one. Um, that one is probably the one that just jumps out to me the most. But, yes, ma'am. Um, and kind of back to the previous point, when he comes before Pilate, Pilate is giving him every out. Pilate doesn't, and Pilate finally even says, but but what crime is he committed? And and that's the exact point. Mm -hmm. That that's the exact point. He never committed a crime. And that is for us, he, you know, in our system, that's the exact opposite. You wouldn't be punished for that, but he was because the people wanted him to be. And again, fast forward two thousand years or so. It's amazing to think about, and those those two very much go together. But the the righteous is crucified for the rebels. Um, absolutely. There's a lot of references in this passage to uh, royalty. There's the purple robe, which purple was a royal color. There's a, a crown um, of thorns, albeit, that's placed on his head. They kneel before him as they would a king. They actually call him the king of Israel, um, the king of the Jews. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of references to the, the royal, and they do it in mockery, yeah. not realizing that they are truly before the son of God and the king of Israel. Yeah, and that's, a, that's an amazing one because it's like they think they're being ironic in that moment, right? They're ironically mocking Christ in, in an ironic way, and yet they're participating in perhaps the greatest irony. Or maybe we could think about it like this. The, the one who is mocked as the king <coughs> is the king, right? That, I, I mean, here, here they are, all the things you just mentioned. They're putting the robe on him. They're... they're they're placing the crown of, of thorns. Um, they're kneeling before him, paying homage to him. Um, and in fact, even this whole scene is, uh, we, we talked about this a few weeks back in, in one of the Lord's Supper talks where there's uh, the Roman triumphal procession. Um, and Mark, what he seems to be doing is intentionally drawing our eyes to specific things that happened at Jesus' crucifixion to... Uh, subvert the Roman triumph. Uh, so the, the, the Roman triumph was about the uh, veneration of the emperor to the realm of the gods. And all of these things, like the purple robe and uh, the placing of the crown and the praetorian guard who would prepare the emperor for that day, all of those components are right here, but in the, the most subversive, unexpected way. Um, and so the one who's mocked as the king is the king. Um, another one that sort of jumps out is the, the one who is made powerless is all powerful. You think about uh, what it said where, where they, they, they take uh, the pastor by Simon of Cyrene. And this is interesting. Um, it, it's interesting that it's Simon. Uh, some will point to that and say th this is the role that Simon Peter should have played, but Simon of Cyrene is the one who is bearing the cross. 
Um, and then another interesting fact, I just love stuff like this. Alexander and Rufus, like why, why do they mention them? You know, isn't that kind of weird like to mention his kids? Well, it's, it's believed that Alexander and Rufus were well-known disciples within the first century. And so Mark referencing, hey, this was the father of Alexander and Rufus, the readers would have been like, oh yeah, we know, we know Alexander and Rufus. Um, that's, that's amazing that they're, so, um, but, but think about in this moment, he's so weakened. He's so willingly emptied of his power that he cannot even bear his own cross. Someone else comes and, and bears the cross for him and he's pinned to this cursed tree and can do nothing, can't even, as Tom Holland mentioned, can't even beat away the birds. Um, made absolutely powerless in this moment, or, or like the, the talk that Lawrence gave a, a few weeks back about being, uh, how, how uh, he, he talked about David, how Saul wants to pin David to the wall. Well, and then looking at Christ as he is pinned down in that moment is the very thing that makes him all, power, all, all powerful. Uh, that makes him uh, uh, beyond what what anybody could ever uh, uh, attain to, whatever whatever anyone could could restrict him to. Uh, the one who's made powerless is all powerful in this moment. But then also, also this is one that was mentioned: the one who cannot save himself is the savior of all. And this is what both uh, Terry and Philip, you both mentioned this. Um, what, what would have happened if Christ had come down, you know, um, could have called 10,000 angels? What if he did? You know, would they have believed in that moment? Probably. I mean, I would think. But what would that have accomplished? Um, it's absolutely and, and ironically true. The one uh, who, who can save others cannot save himself. The one who cannot save himself is in that moment becoming the savior of all. And then this one, the one who is forsaken is the only one who is faithful. So, so the, the, the one uh, God, as he is constantly faithful to mankind, who, who, who uh, he even says, right, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then Christ in this moment, and there's, I guess, debate among people about what exactly that means, that Christ is forsaken. But at least from his perspective, he is forsaken in, in the most horrible way. But the one who is forsaken, ironically, is the one who is the, the only one who is faithful. The only one who is faithful. And then, finally, the one who is defeated is ultimately victorious. Um, and so here are some of these... Uh, just a few observations from the, the ironies uh, within the cross. Um, before we move on, are there, are there any others that y'all want to draw our attention to before we move on? Actually, I just remembered, it's, we, we leave at 1040, right? Not 1045, all right? Okay, um, let's, let's move on. Uh, this, is, this is what, um, uh, I forgot his name, the, the, the same man who wrote The Irony of the Cross, this is what he mentions. Within Mark 15, he says, The Almighty is weakened. The Sovereign is shamed. The Christ is crucified. The King is condemned. The righteous uh, is with the rebels. Uh, the beloved is blasphemed. The light in darkness. The faithful is forsaken. The eternal expired. And the Redeemer is recognized. In that final statement, truly this was the Son of God. But um, the... Oh, and then, and then his 11th one is this. He kind of has a bonus one. The ones responsible for his death are gifted his resurrection life. Um, and he recognizes this from his perspective as the greatest reversal. The ones responsible for his death are gifted his resurrection life. And uh, the, the question, the takeaway is, okay, in what ways does the irony of the cross provide a pattern for our lives? One word that I've really come to just really love to, to reflect on and to think about. It's not, it's not in scripture. It, it came along uh, later in church history, but the word cruciform, the idea of the, the shape of the cross and the idea of living a cruciform life, a uh, life that is shaped and molded in every way 
by the cross. And so as a reflection, um, what does the irony of the cross, in what ways does this irony provide a pattern for our lives? And in that, I think Romans 12 is helpful. He says, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and perfect and acceptable. And I'll just close with this thought. I think it's interesting that that, that Paul calls, the, he, he says, live this cruciform life. Don't, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be conformed to the pattern of the cross. And he says, in that, in the living out of this cruciform life, you will test and then discern what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. And it's as if he's saying, when we live this cruciform life, we come to not only see in the cross the power and the wisdom of God, but the power and wisdom of God becomes realized in our own cruciform life. We realize that, yes, victory does come through defeat, and that uh, uh, glory is in suffering. And, and over the next classes, um, that's what we'll look at. We'll look at uh, how the irony of the cross is manifest in our own cruciform lives. And so I think Thank you for the, uh, the comments and, and everything, and I look forward to being back together on Wednesday.